Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to MCN's second Google Hangout uh, session, MCN Pro session. I'm going to hand it over to Scott Sayer, board member at MCN, to uh, do some introductions. Hi, everyone. I'm glad you can join us for this second MCN Pro session. As you probably know, MCN has been offering for the last year MCN Pro online uh, workshops. And we're actually going through a rethink right now as to exactly how we want to uh, format those workshops into the future. But as uh, something to keep everybody busy and thinking, in the meantime, we decided we would do a couple Hangouts uh, using Google Plus Hangout on Air just to show everybody how it works and to talk a little bit about what it does, what it doesn't do. And uh, as Ryan said, this is the second one. The first one we really covered uh, some just basics, and we had a, a, a few guests with us, one of whom is returning, and that's Stephanie Powell from the Museum of Modern Art. And um, we have two new folks with us this time. We have Daniel Wolf from the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> and we have Josh Lee from the Minnesota Zoo, who is uh, local to me since I'm in Minneapolis right now. Uh, I'm actually going to stay on the MCN board, but I am going to become the Chief Digital Officer at the Corning Museum of Glass in two weeks. So I'm, this is my, my last official broadcast from this office. So um, we've already run into some technical problems this morning, and, um, and this is kind of what comes with using Google+. You get a lot of bang for, for no buck. Uh, at, at, but at the same time, there are issues that you have to deal with every time, and some of them are upgrade issues, and some of them are issues of things not working the way they did the last time. And uh, uh, I'm going to let Ryan start off with a little bit of an introduction. He'll tell you uh, a little bit about what we ran into at the beginning and what we were attempting to do and, and what we're going to change a little bit here. And uh, after Ryan, after you introduce yourself, why don't you pass the baton and we'll go around and give Part of the reason we have these uh, guests here today is we really want to have them share what they're using Google Plus for, or Google Hangout for uh, in their institutions. And they're also here as reference and uh, for all of you to be able to ask questions of. So Ryan's going to explain a little bit about how we're going to do the Q&A. And take it away, Ryan. Um, thanks, Scott. So, um I'm, uh, I'm Ryan Dodge, and I work at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, uh, and I'm the social media coordinator there. And I've uh, been using Hangouts for about a year now, and uh, over that year, it's been really interesting. Um, there's always different quirks and, and quirks that happen with Hangout, and things change all the time. One of those things um, is the Q&A function, and it's a great function to um, have real interaction with people. Um, they can ask questions throughout the Hangout, um, when it works. Um, when we were starting up this Hangout, we found that uh, there was an issue. And when we tried to enable the Q&A uh, app, um, uh, there was a glitch in, in Google. So we're going to go to Plan B. And I'm just going to share my screen here um, to show you what we're going to do. If you head to the uh, event page on, um, on Google+, or if you're watching through YouTube, um, there's a comment section on the event page. You can add comments there. Here's the link for everyone. Um, um, you can also search it. Um, if you type in more free hang time in Google, you, it should pop up the event page. Um, we're also going to watch Twitter. So we're going to use the, uh, the MCN Pro hashtag. And so if you have any questions as we go along, we'll be watching that as well. Um, just to give you an idea um, of what we did last time, um, I've added a bunch of links here. Um, of uh, different uh, of the first session that we did, that was more of the basic session on how to start up a Google Plus account for your institution, how to link it to your um, to your YouTube channel, um, and then also the slide deck is there and uh, the cheat sheet that Scott and I created. There's also a link here to the tips and tricks document that um, I developed with uh, Stephanie and Mike Morosky from the Portland Art Museum and Lisa Mazzola from MoMA. And then there's a quick little tip here about using PowerPoints in Google Hangout if you're uh, if you're if you like using PowerPoints. Um, 
here's another slide with a, a lot of different support resources. Um, one of the things that's uh, a little difficult with, with Google Hangouts is that there's no real-time support. Um, so you basically have to use um, the support.google.com uh, uh, different message boards to go through if you have any issues. Um, but really, um, it's a great tool. It's uh, As Scott said, you get a lot of bang for your buck because it's free, but there's also um, some glitches that pop up that you have to deal with in real time. Um, this is what the Q&A function would normally look like if it, if it was working. Um, it's a straight um, uh, chat box on the side here, um, and you just type in your questions. Um, the people taking part in the Hangout can see those questions. Um, they can answer them in real time, and by clicking on this little drop-down um, uh, button, you can actually click that the question was answered, and it will timestamp the question so that you can go through the questions instead of watching the whole Hangout and actually click through to see the, the answers to the questions that you're most interested in. Um, and then this is where you enable it um, on your event page. This is an old example from one of our earlier Hangouts. And then when it works, um, the Q&A is highlighted there in the, in the screen. But obviously that's not happening today, um, unfortunately. So go with Plan B if you're, um, uh, if you're following along. Uh, enter your comments in the event page and we'll make sure to get to those. Also, the MCM Pro hashtag uh, through Twitter. Now, I'd like to hand it over to my colleagues here that are going to be uh, talking about what how they've used uh, Google Hangouts at their institutions. Um, uh, Scott, you want to... Sorry, Scott. I was just going to say a, cu a couple quick uh, things. The um, slide deck that Ryan's going to upload. It's going to have all those URLs in it. I know most of them were big and ugly, and they're probably snickering when you saw them on the screen. We're not expecting that you're going to jot them down really quickly, but you are going to be able to get all those things from the from the slide deck that Ryan had up there. The other thing I wanted to point out is this was advertised as having Mike Murkowski on the call today, but he was called away, and so he's not a part of the Hangout today, and uh, it's, that's too bad because he had a lot to add from the Portland Art Museum. But... Uh, He'll be back. So, okay, Stephanie, take it away. All right. So, um, Google Hangouts is one of the tools that we use to engage with global audiences, and we've used it really to provide a way to kind of broaden the reach of our in-gallery engagement methods. And our first kind of entree into using Hangouts was actually between our community and access team, and um, we partnered with a group called the Virtual Senior Center. Um, and what the Virtual Senior Center does is it brings um, virtual experiences, face-to-face -face experiences with homebound seniors. And so we partnered with them initially to have some of our educators come online and to use some of the engagement methods um, in terms of you know, inquiry methods with works of art in our collection to seniors. And then... Um, we decided in April to, in 2013 to start hosting them ourselves, again with um, this idea of bringing this kind of inquiry-based discussion method um, out into the, the broader uh, world um, if you couldn't come physically to the museum. And so our first art hang was an uh, inquiry-based discussion around the theme of identity um, through the lens of works by Cindy Sherman and Martin Kippenberger. And, in that first event, uh, we were just experimenting with the format. We wanted to bring in um, kind of non-experts, a panel of non-experts, people who um, did not necessarily have a great background in art, and to kind of have them come in and engage in an uh, inquiry-based discussion about these works of art. Um, and then more recently, we've actually been using uh, Hangouts as a way to add a kind of synchronous um, element to some of the uh, MOOC courses that we've been um, developing. So our first MOOC course was, and if you don't know what MOOC stands for, it's Massive Open Online Course, and we work, we partner with um, a platform provider called Coursera to develop um, free professional development courses for K-12 teachers around the world. And our first one was about art and inquiry. So again, that was um, a perfect way to have the course instructor Lisa Mazzola come in and um, answer questions, actually have sort of an open house um, sort of format because if you've taken a MOOC course or you're familiar with them, you know that most of it is um, 
asynchronous. It's designed so that you can, whatever um, time zone you're in, you can log on to the course and you can partake in the content, the course content, which is a lot of video and a lot of text. A lot of people actually need that more face-to-face -face interaction with the instructor, and so Hangouts was just a perfect way to do that, and not only did it allow us to have to integrate some of this face-to-face -face interaction, but also because the Hangouts are auto-archived on YouTube, that meant that you know people didn't have to stay up till 3 in the morning in order to see Lisa. They could log on at whatever time worked for them. Um, and so for Art and Inquiry, it was a it was an excellent tool, and we plan on using it again in July uh, when we launch our next MOOC course, which is called Art and Activity. And that's going to be available um, July 7th. So we are already brainstorming ways to make use of this tool for um, to provide some of that face-to-face -face time with the instructors, one of whom is myself. The other is Jessica Baldenhofer. And uh, of our school and teacher programs team, and then also Lisa Mazzola of our um, school and teacher programs group. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Steph. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, mention how we've used the, the tool at, at the ROM, and then I'll get to Josh and Dan. Um, we've asked Josh and Dan to take part in this Hangout today because they've used uh, sort of a special version of Hangouts called Connected Classrooms, and it's something that we, we didn't really get to uh, last um, last time around. So I'm gonna, just going to talk quickly about how we've used it, and then we'll hand it over to Josh and Dan. Um, at the ROM, we've been using Hangouts for a little over a year now. Um, we use them to showcase our curatorial staff um, to really turn them into rock stars in a way, um, to highlight their passions, their expertise, and their knowledge um, about what they do at the museum. We've been able to, we've been very lucky to, to hang out with uh, curatorial staff while they're in the field as well. I'm sure uh, many of you know about um, the blue whale uh, that's been, that we've just recovered um, up in Newfoundland. And we've, uh, we were lucky enough to hang out with, with two of our, our team members who were up there uh, recovering that blue whale, so that was that was really great. We've also used Hangouts during uh, a media preview for an exhibition. Um, last spring, we held uh, an exhibition of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition from the, the Natural History Museum in London, England, and we brought in someone from NHM and also an artist from Vancouver, and really um, really added a, a great element to our media preview. The media people were uh, able to ask questions of the, of the artist and also of uh, the representative from it at NHM. Um, and, and for us, um, just to, to talk a, a little bit about the auto archive to YouTube, for us, that's a real benefit of using uh, Google Plus and, and Google Plus Hangouts on Air, is that, is that content gets auto recorded and, and uploaded to your YouTube channel. We've had uh, views on our on our hangouts from over 85 countries around the world, um, you know, and and we've spent uh, we bought a, a webcam and that's it. That's all the money we've spent on on our on our hangouts. So, um, you know, it really is an accessible tool um, for museums of all sizes um, to use to to create video content that they can then share and 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 repurpose later on. Um, uh, Josh, and maybe we'll go we'll go to Josh first, um, and you may want to talk a little bit about how you've used Google Hangouts and connected classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a disclaimer: if I have to jump up because the lights shut off, it's because <laughs> they automatically go off if there isn't enough movement. So I'm not running away. I'm, I'll be back soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've used um, the Minnesota Zoo has used uh, connected classrooms, um, which is a special version of Google Plus Hangouts on Air that you mentioned. Um, just recently, uh, we were actually one of the launch partners back in November when this program started. And if you have been with Google Hangouts on Air for a while, you may have noticed um, something called the virtual field trips. And connected classrooms is essentially just you know a more narrow down, down version of that, and kind of just fine tuning that program. Uh, but like Stephanie said, you know it's really just a great way for the Minnesota Zoo um, and zoos in general um, as living museums to just connect face to face with our audiences from different parts of the world. We, um, you know, we really want to, you know, give people that experience 
where other social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, um, it can potentially be a two-way conversation with commenting and replies, but the Google Hangouts on Air really gives people the, the video aspect and the great imagery of us being able to bring animals um, on screen um, as well as um, like right now, I'm actually in one of our classrooms that has a penguin, part of the penguin exhibit viewing area. So we're able to go around to different areas of the zoo that um, you may not even be able to see um, if you live in the area but don't come to the zoo. And we're able to um, also showcase some of our zookeepers and the great work that they're doing. And so we always try to have an animal expert on who can have an animal um, right up in front of the camera for all of our online guests to see. So um, that's the biggest way that we're doing it. And we found that it's a great way to connect with um, kids specifically of all ages. Um, and then we're able to also work with our education department and tailor um, programming specific to you know, a certain grade level or a certain focus, whether it's a science program or a math program. Um, so we've been, we've been kind of tooling around and, and working with it for a while. And so, yeah, we, we try to do something at least once a month. Um, and use this tool, whether it be specifically with connected classrooms or just Hangouts on Air and have it be a little bit more general uh, for anyone. Um, but we always try to make our content interesting for all ages, whether it's focused for sixth to eighth grade or you know, preschool to first grade. We try to, try to make it so that it, it is appealing to everyone um, because like you guys had mentioned before, it does get auto-archived to YouTube and we are able to use this content um, as an education tool you know, in the future, which is, which is always a plus. So, Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. And uh, Daniel? Great. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, like others have said, uh, we've been using, uh, you know, really all of the Google Collaborative products more and more uh, throughout uh, the museum, whether that's uh, Google Docs to uh, collaborate work on uh, lesson plans or templates. Uh, and really the Hangouts uh, was another way, another tool to use uh, in that further collaboration. Uh, so the museum uh, has been using Hangouts and Hangouts on Air in a variety of different ways. Uh, probably most notably is our Science Bulletins program has been using it uh, to do data visualizations uh, with working scientists uh, to really support the work that they're doing um, in the science videos that they make. Uh, we've also, uh, you know, partnered with Google uh, with the Connected Classroom Initiative really to bring uh, the museum and the scientists at the museums to a wider audience and to really reveal uh, a bit of the human side of the science as well. Uh, to really uh, let students know uh, from around the country, you know, here's a scientist, uh, a world famous scientist, you know, you can talk to them, you can ask them, uh, you know, how do you become a scientist? What do you do? What do you study? Here's a question uh, that I really always uh, wanted to ask as scientists. Uh, the two connected classroom experiences that we've done so far has uh, revolved around dinosaurs and really hitting that uh, sweet spot uh, with that sort of uh, fifth grade to middle school audience where you just really see the excitement in the students sitting on the edge of their seats, uh, it's, it's really great. Uh, and it's really just been a way uh, to expand the mission of the museum. Awesome. Um, Dan, I wondered if you could talk a bit about, and, and maybe Josh as well, um, how you get involved with Connected Classroom. Um, is there sort of like, you know, an application process or, mm -hmm. or how, does that, how does that all work? So uh, it sounds similar to Josh's experience. Uh, in our case, uh, Google had approached the museum uh, to be a, a launch partner in this effort. Uh, I know other institutions that are interested in uh, hosting connected classroom experiences. Uh, if you just search uh, connected classrooms uh, with Google, you'll get taken to that website. And there is a, a Google form, of course, uh, that you can fill out uh, with information uh, you know, about your program and, and what you could offer. And uh, Google will then uh, reach out to you, is my understanding how that will work. OK, great. Josh, anything to add on that? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would just echo exactly what he uh, mentioned, is if you're um, someone who wants to actually be a presenter. And if you're an educator who's looking at getting involved with connected classrooms for you know, your classrooms or other students in your school, um, there is actually a group on Google Plus called the Connected Classrooms Community. And you know, they have, where all of us who are you know, providing 
different hangout experiences and stuff like that. We post all of those experiences online in those different groups, depending on you know the topic or the age range or anything like that. And so that's a great way for you to go and get linked in with um, or connected with you know different groups that are hosting these. And um, yeah, so that's just another another resource is the community that's on Google Plus. Okay, that's great. And um, um, just so everyone's aware, the the slides that we produce for today have links to um, find out more information about connected classrooms and uh, and uh, how to sign up and things like that. Um, we we we're getting a few questions on Twitter. Scott, did you want to answer these real quick, or do you want to keep keep going? Well, I I have actually a. a why don't you prepare the questions from Twitter? I have a, I have a question from the event page, uh, and this is to both Josh and Daniel from Denise Roberts. She says, can you describe a little bit about the, the student-educator interactions in the collected classrooms, connected classrooms, and are the students using the text Q&A, or what other features might they use for interaction? Either one of you want to start? <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, when the Q&A feature works, we definitely always try to utilize that feature, and that's specifically for the students um, in classrooms who aren't able to participate on camera with us. The zoo always tries to have an offer out um, to educators who are able to be on camera. We always try to have about five to six classrooms actually on camera with us, and so then those students actually get the actual real-time conversation with the zookeeper or the animal expert, whatever, um, whoever may be on camera with us. But then, yeah, we always try to have um, the Q&A feature up and running when it's possible. And we also um, do the same thing as what we're doing right now with the MCN Pro hashtag on Twitter is we'll just come up with a hashtag that we use for Hangouts, and then um, I'll monitor kind of everything as the coordinator, and we'll uh, field out questions that way. Great. Uh, the museum does uh, something similar. Um, what we've done, and actually uh, something that I'll probably say over and over again uh, as advice for doing these for it is, uh, one innovation at a time. Uh, so our our first uh, connected classroom experience that we did, uh, we were just looking at the interaction between uh, the actual classrooms that were within the Hangout with us, um, and you know had a, a Q and A session with them. Uh, for the second one uh, that we've run, uh, we did have the the Q and A app running uh, and using a, a tablet. Uh, allowed uh, the curator and educator to sort of scroll through the selection of questions uh, and answer them live uh, in between uh, the, the questions uh, from the classrooms in the Hangout. And that really gave uh, a nice space for the classrooms to be able to get the next student up and get ready um, and for uh, the curator and educator to, to find a good question from the Q&A app. So can you say a little bit about just kind of your general, because I'm guessing that most of the participants here haven't actually gotten to see one of your uh, Connected Classroom broadcasts. Can you say a little bit about how they're, and actually, Stephanie, even though you're not doing Connected Classrooms, I think it would be useful to kind of just walk people through a little of, of what your program looks like from beginning to end. It's, it's you know, is it is it very similar to what we're looking at right now where we've got three experts sitting as talking heads, or are you bringing in other supplementary materials, media, still images? Um, I think it'd be good to give people a little bit of an idea of what, what how you're mixing it up. Mm -hmm. you want to start, Stephanie? Sure. Um, so, you know, we've been, every time that we've actually hosted a Hangout, it's been a little bit different, and we're continuing to experiment with it because the tool is really just a blank slate. And the good thing is they keep adding new features like Q&A, which has been incredibly useful. Um, and also recently they, um, I don't know if this is something Dan and Josh, uh, which is something that you might find useful in terms of working with youngsters, but they now enabled, um, have enabled uh, private Hangouts on Air. So that, you know, in terms of getting releases and things like that, that actually might be a boon for you guys because if it's a private broadcast then perhaps you don't have to go through that whole rigmarole. But you know that's a total tangent. Um, the way that um, we have used it in the past is 
you know, we want it to be highly interactive. And so what we usually do is I'm uh, the producer, and then we usually have a, an educator. Um, in the past, it's been Lisa Mazzola and Jessica Baldenhofer. Um, but also outside of MoMA, we have, um, for example, for um, a hangout that we did in um, March, we actually had a guest speaker, and that was Laurel Schmidt, who um, is a very well-known educator who happens to live in Los Angeles. And we were using a lot of her readings in the MOOC course, um, the Art and Inquiry MOOC course. And so we thought, what a great opportunity to actually get um, Laurel in and give that, you know, give a chance to people for people to actually ask her real time questions and to have her respond. And so um, we kind of patched, um, you know, we had Lisa there and then we patched in Laurel and we used the QA app um, because we think it's a more uh, democratic way of getting um, people people's questions um, heard. You can moderate the uh, the questions. But it, it, it also is, um, you know, kind of crowdsourcing the questions because people can upvote the questions that they want uh, to be answered. Um, so that takes the burden off us to moder you know, in terms of moderation. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. We've had, for some of our Hangouts, uh, we've had people from over 120 countries um, coming in and watching either in real time or watching the archive version. So. Are you are you bringing in any other types of media other than just the uh, oh, yeah. talking heads? Can you talk a little bit about what other types of media you use? Yes, yes. Sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we we use obviously we're talking about in many in in many cases we're actually talking about artworks. And so what we can do is we use the screen share um, method. Uh, which is a built-in functionality in the Hangout platform, and um, I will create, you know, a PDF or a slideshow and just have it on my desktop, and then um, I can share um, and show the image in the big screen. Um, and we found, you know, at first we wanted to really, um, we ran some tests using video, streaming video, and streaming audio via screen share. Um, and we decided in the end it really, the experience is just not up to par yet. Um, it's too choppy. It's um, kind of unreliable. And so we really stick with um, just kind of still um, images at this point. And Ryan, that's been your experience as well, is that correct? With, with, with video? Um, yeah, we've never really had great success with video. Um, same, it's it just creates lag um, within the within the hangout, and, and it gets a little choppy. Um, we stick to uh, sometimes we'll share a Google Map if we're talking to someone that's not in our location. Um, screen share a PowerPoint or some images, obviously. Um, but really, we we keep it quite simple and and really let uh, let the the people do. Do do the legwork, do the talking, um, because at, at the end of the day, the you know it's it's the people that you want to showcase and that interaction between uh, them and your audience, um, you know. And if the Q and A function was working, <laughs> it, we would see that um, have that actual interaction in real time, and that that for us is our main goal. Um, you know, we don't really do Twitter chats at, at the wrong. We do Hangouts, um, and we do Hangouts because there is the opportunity to have. Uh, that live interaction with people, that face-to-face, -face, back and forth, um, you know, and, and some people may not agree with that strategy, but um, we've just found that that it's that it's worked for us. Um, I, I just want to uh, get to a, a question that Amy uh, Amy Fox asked through Twitter, and she asked about the media preview that we ran through Hangout, and. Um, we have a space that's in gallery that we can set up like a studio, and there's a big um, projection screen on the wall. And we just hook up a laptop um, to that projection screen. We um, put the Hangout up on that wall, and so we do take questions. The people that are presenting in the Hangout can ask each other questions, and then the media on the floor, the live studio audience, if you will, can also ask questions. Um, so it's a great way. We turn it almost into a, to a live broadcast um, like you're watching a TV show almost, um, and and we've done that a few different times uh, with the hangouts we've done, and also Amy also asked about working with education staff, 
and how do you work on cross depart departmental cooperation and do you have digital savvy savvy people in education and I would I would just say that um, I don't search the institution for digital savvy people I search the institution for people that have a great story to tell and I handle um, the other stuff I make sure that you know the connection works and they have all the tools that they need um, you know the hour or two before I hang out I'm running around um, trying to make sure everything's working I handle all that stuff so they don't have to worry about it and they can just focus on on the content or the story or the you know the information that they're about to deliver so you know really um, it's nice to have a couple of people that are familiar with the tool behind the scenes that aren't going to be on screen that can help you um, but at the end of the day um, you know it's it's really up to the main producer and getting the content and the people on, on screen and making sure everything works mm -hmm. And I would just add that um, I am from the education department, and <laughs> right now the um, you know the it's all run by educators, and uh, we would love to expand it further throughout the museum. And I think there's definitely um, an openness and an interest in using this tool for other purposes. But for right now, um, it's all coming out of education. Um, so the yeah. same thing at AM and H. I did want to hop on a, a comment that you guys were talking about before, which is the sharing of video. Uh, we've had the same experience as well, that the video is really choppy and laggy and the, the audio doesn't always sync up. Uh, and actually just something for folks to be aware of, uh, this is something that uh, Google told us, uh, that you shouldn't use video in Hangouts on Air because of the content ID system that YouTube has in place, that even if it's your own content, your Hangout on Air YouTube video can get flagged for content ID and taken down uh, mid-broadcast. So it was definitely the recommendation from Google uh, that you don't try to share any video uh, through the interface. I know in, in regular Hangouts, you can co-watch YouTube videos together, and so I'm hoping that that ability comes to Hangouts on Air and any media that you wanted to share in video format, you could upload to YouTube beforehand and, and then play it uh, in the Hangout. But right now, that doesn't exist. Yeah. Any, uh, going back to the question that uh, I asked Stephanie earlier about just kind of how you format your, your Hangout and bring in additional media, do you have any other, again, because people aren't seeing how oh, yeah. you your connected classrooms work. Can you tell us a little bit about how you how you formulate those? Yeah, so uh, what we've been uh, doing, sort of our run of show, is typically uh, we have some educational materials that we send out to the classrooms uh, beforehand, uh, and then the educator and curator uh, give a brief presentation, uh, which typically involves a, a slideshow. And what we found really successful is to have sort of a, a dedicated uh, slideshow computer or laptop uh, that hooks into the Hangout, uh, and then you can sort of seamlessly switch between the two um, and uh, don't have to deal with sort of the sharing the screen and, and getting folks uh, back into focus. Uh, and then after uh, they walk them through the slideshow, in the last case it was a slideshow of the new exhibit on uh, pterosaurs that just opened here at the museum. Um, and it's a way for uh, to really expand, um, you know, what you're talking about. You know, you're, you're talking about pterosaurs, and you can have a, a couple items in front, but if you really want to show this huge size of an animal, you know, with a massive wingspan, it's, it's really helpful to see it in the actual exhibit. Uh, and then we'll normally bring that back uh, to the curator and educator talking about, uh, you know, what they just saw, and the educator will act as a bit of a cipher for the audience uh, to ask a couple questions uh, before we turn, uh, you know, to the actual class for the Q&A app for questions. Great. How about, how about you, Josh? you have uh, anything to add about how you guys formulate things there at the zoo? Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our run of show is very similar to kind of what everyone else has been, you know, saying. I'm, I'm typically the moderator, and so... I'm always on, and then we'll always have another um, screen or computer with the animal expert wherever they are within the zoo. Um, we always, I always try to be prepared. Um, you always try to be prepared, and it ne never seems to be prepared enough. Um, <laughs> but we always have a slideshow or photos on hand of whatever animal or whatever topic we're talking about. But it's always our first preference to actually just be there right live from the exhibit where... Um, 
you know, the animal expert, the zookeeper, the horticulturalist, whoever is on camera can actually be there and pointing out certain things within the exhibit um, or about the animal right on camera so that it's a little bit more engaging. Um, but we always try to have that backup because um, technical difficulties happen all the time. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we always want to have backups. And like you guys have said with the video, um, we always, if we're going to have an animal on camera that they might not be able to have in their hands or um, be right up there. We always have another computer um, facing the screen or you know hooked up to the webcam, whatever it may be, so that um, we still do get that the animal experience. But it's pretty much exactly the same as how everyone else is. We always do the Q and A at the end uh, with all the different classrooms that are on or the different participants, just so that uh, they are able to hear all the content that we have first and then whatever questions they still have, they were more than willing to answer. Well, good segue to a question that just came in from Ann Botman about Q&A, and her question is, does the Q&A feature stay with the archive in YouTube after the event? Which is one of the really cool things about Q&A is that it does, and it synchronizes so that if the presenters are on the ball, they can actually indicate when the question is being addressed and, and it's actually like time time synchronized with the video so you can actually just click on the different Q&A questions and jump right to that section of the archive video. So that's actually a, a really cool feature. Mm -hmm. But I believe um, just the questions that are chosen by the moderator, correct? Mm -hmm. The other ones are not, like the, the questions that are submitted but not answered are those preserved as well in the archive? I think maybe not. All, all of the all of the questions are still listed in the Q and A. Yeah. When you watch on YouTube, it'll it'll be enabled on the left hand side, okay. and then yeah, as the moderator, you have to click on the on the drop down list and click on answered question when the people are answering the question throughout the hangout. So your job as the moderator is is a little more involved when the Q and A is is enabled, but. Um, that allows the timestamp to happen. Um, so you can still see all of the questions unless the moderator deletes them, um, if you're getting spam questions or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic feature. Um, when you go to the archive video, you can just site, scroll down through the questions and, and click on them, and it, the video jumps right to it. It's, it's fantastic when it works. Yeah. I, I want to just... You know, one of the things that, that uh, Ryan and I have been kind of joking around about since we started working on this, these podcasts, these podcasts, yeah, <laughs> these <laughs> hangouts, is that, you know, we're doing a hangout talking about hangouts. And, you know, we, right before we went on air, we were, we were all facing this thing of, well, do we go live? We've told all these people. We've invited all these people. Do we go live? We have no control over the fact that q and is not working right now. Uh, you know, and, and this would be very much, you know, any one of you who are doing a hangout, you could face the exact same thing. And I don't think any of us have run into it before, but this is what it means to be using a tool like this. And, uh, you know, these, these guys were good at thinking on their feet and said, well, let's just go ahead and we'll work with Twitter and we'll work with the comments that are coming up on the events page. And uh, you know, we're trying to lead by example here a little bit and, and show you that, it, this is a little bit of the wild west here, but you can make do, and you but you have to be prepared to troubleshoot on the on the fly. Ryan, do we have any more Twitter questions? Uh, not right now. Okay, I had a I had a I had a kind of a follow up question to 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 that, which is, what do you guys have for backup and technical support? I mean, I, I think I'll, obviously you can just fire up a laptop and and jump right into this and do it. But it's also a lot of institutional responsibility to be saying, uh, you know, the American Museum of Natural History is is doing a Google Hangout or MoMA's doing a Google Hangout and, and, and having a technical problem where you've got hundreds of people that are potentially lined up and then you run into a, 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 a hiccup. What do you guys... What if anything, and maybe there's nothing, but what do you what do you do to give yourself some sense of sanity when it comes to potentially hitting some, you know, your internet's down or your computer doesn't work or whatever? 
Uh, anyone want to go first? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. I mean, I think for us, uh, one thing that we always do is we contact our ID, IT department ahead of time to let them know this is when we're going to be doing this, just to make sure they're not doing some sort of, um, you know, network uh, maintenance or something during that time. Um, in terms of timing, we have also scheduled it after hours um, so that, you know, we can be ensured that the um, speed of the um, network connection is going to be really fast um, without all those people work at their desktops working. Um, we also, I would say, just logistically for us, it's really worked to have one dedicated person who is the kind of producer um, of the event, and that person's role is not to be kind of also the expert um, speaker, but the person who, and this is usually me, is, in fact it's always been me, is to kind of take charge of producing that event just as you would um, any public program. Um, and then what we've also done is in terms of um, monitoring, even though the Q&A um, app has kind of, in many cases, except for in this case, eliminated the need to have people submit questions via the Google event page or via Twitter, um, you know, it, some people still, you know, will submit questions via those other channels. And so what we've done is we've also asked perhaps an intern to kind of be the dedicated um, social media maven for that event and they'll be in the, uh, they'll be one of the windows but they'll be muted and they'll be hidden um, from the camera but they're in the uh, Google Hangout so that they can use the chat function, the built-in chat function and copy and paste in any queries that we get through those other um, unsanctioned or unpromoted channels. Um, and then in terms of, um, as Ryan mentioned earlier about technical support, um, we've also uh, subscribed to some, uh, some boards. So Hangout Helpers is one. Um, the other one is escaping me, but I can find out the name of it um, uh, later. Uh, but those, those discussion boards, um, on, which are Google, basically Google Plus communities, have been really helpful and the people there are really passionate about using this tool and are very proactive in sharing their knowledge about it. So I would highly suggest that you join up with one of those discussion forums. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing in that, that again, it's it's not a commercial product and yet in some in some cases you find people who are in this support forums enthusiasm so great that you'll get a quicker response from those people that are just lurking there waiting to help somebody than you would if you were actually uh, paying somebody for support for a commercial product. So if you haven't actually, I know a lot of people are nervous about going into discussion boards and you know support forums because it's just not something, it's something that people that work with technology do a lot, but it, a lot of times it's, it's new territory for other people. It's Once you register, it's not so bad and uh, you should try it once and, and you'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would say just one more thing. Um, also, to, to um, Google's credit, even though they're a huge, obviously a huge organization, um, we've actually had a lot of um, help uh, from the Google education team, uh, Vertical. I guess the Vertical, they call themselves. Um, but they have been very proactive about reaching out to us and helping us in for before our first hangout, they actually, you know, we're lucky enough. We're we're in L, we're in uh, New York where they have an office. They actually invited us in and helped us, with, walked us through the process of setting it up. But they have also been really helpful in terms of getting on the phone with us to answer any technical questions. So I would recommend, uh, you know, perhaps getting in touch with them, with them. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add to that um, if you're thinking about using this tool, um, you can set it up um, and hang out with a couple of colleagues at your institution and not go live just to test out some of the functionalities um, without having that, that recording go to your YouTube channel. Um, you know, to hold a hangout with some colleagues um, you know, for a couple of minutes and just see how it functions and works and play around with the buttons and things like that. As long as you, you guys can't see it here, but there's a there's a button at the bottom of the hangout window and it's it's start or stop broadcast. As long as you don't hit start broadcast, your hangout won't go live. 
Um, so you can you can play around in, in a safe space there, um, you know, without uh, without doing too much damage. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I would uh, echo exactly what Ryan and Stephanie said um, about just being prepared. And I think one way that the zoo, the Minnesota Zoo, is always prepared is Wi-Fi is great, and it's definitely helpful. Um, you know, for a lot of different things, but we always try when we're doing a hangout to be hardwired, um, just because you never know when Wi-Fi connection's gonna go down or something's gonna happen. Um, and we too, we always try to contact IT, and we actually, since I usually am at my desk kind of moderating and, and kind of switching between cameras and stuff like that, I'm never actually with the, the on-camera expert that's talking somewhere else in the zoo. So luckily we have a couple people in the marketing department and that's actually where Google Hangouts lives currently is in our marketing department um, that know their way around the t this tool and I can just send them over and I usually go over help get everything set up and then they're kind of the troubleshooters over there and um, you know we always try to have multiple of everything, headphones, speakers, um, just in case something goes wrong and we can just do a quick, a quick change. Um, whatever we need. So, yeah. As everyone's been saying, like there's lots of technical problems, um, and Google, like Stephanie said, has been really great with us, especially with the Connected Classrooms program. They have um, a great team over there working with us, and they're always reaching out, um, and we can always reach out to them if we have questions or if we have you know anything going on, and they always try to be free, if possible, during one of our Hangouts, in case there is something that goes wrong, and, and something in the back end needs to be changed or fixed or something. So they've been really supportive um, of all of our efforts. So, Great. I guess I would uh, echo also uh, what they're saying. And I, I think each institution really needs to find the solution that is, that is comfortable, um, you know, for your team. Uh, in our case, uh, what we've actually done is sort of split the director role uh, from the technical production role. Uh, and so I take on um, sort of the, the hair pulling of making sure all the equipment's there and everything and that, you know, we have Wi-Fi backup and a backup laptop and, you know, connecting everything. Uh, and so I can just worry about that and the director really can focus on working with the talent on, you know, producing a, a good educational experience uh, for the classrooms. Uh, we found that that sort of helps us uh, both keep our uh, sanity a bit. Um, because I don't need to worry about sort of the run of show. I just need to make sure uh, that the person who's talking is on camera, uh, you know, that we're smoothly switching over to the slideshow or whatever it might be uh, and coming back. Yeah. Great. So uh, what, one of the questions that came in last time was somewhat related, I, and that is, do any of you do anything live in the galleries with Hangout? I mean, as far as, I think, you know, working with the actual th exhibitions in the galleries, or is it mostly more static uh, setups? So we'd like to, uh, in our future uh, Connected Classroom experiences, that's one of the innovations that we're looking uh, to roll out in the future. Uh, maybe something that involves Google Glass or or something uh, along those lines. Um, really, you just uh, add a whole bunch of uh, potential possibilities or problems, uh, especially if you're not going to close down the exhibit space. Um, and then for connected classrooms, uh, because you want to reach live classrooms, you're doing it, uh, you know, during the school day, uh, which are the museum's uh, busiest times. Uh, and so, really, it's a balance between whether or not um, you know, uh, will the experience be made uh, better for the audience, uh, and also what are what are you compromising for the experience uh, for the folks who have chosen to come to your institution uh, for that day as well? I would definitely echo Daniel's um, everything that Daniel said. I mean, for us, we're really using this tool um, as a way to you know, as an engagement tool. So the, and what our focus is really on the discussion that's happening and, and encouraging participation. And, you know, we're definitely not opposed uh, to having that in-gallery experience. In fact, that's one of the things that initially, you know, that was our initial idea was like, great, we'll use this tool, we'll set up a camera in the galleries. And then we started thinking about the actual practicalities of doing that and whether those 
logistical hurdles would actually enhance the experience. And in the end, we thought, you know, this is its own experience. We can use screen share, and frankly, you can we can probably have a better reproduction of the artwork than we could actually provide by setting up the camera in the gallery space. Um, we can use screen share um, to give a better, um, you know, uh, interaction with the artwork. Um, and so we thought, you know, rather than trying to simulate that in-gallery experience, why don't we use this tool um, as a way to have, you know, as a discussion platform and to focus on that and not so much on all of the logistical issues around, like, you know, the museum is open seven days a week now, and the only time we could we could have a real-time experience is some ungodly hour in the morning or sometime really late at night. So, um, you know, I would love to figure out some way, you know, at some point to try to have that in-gallery experience, but I think right now um, people are really um, engaged with the, the way that we've been doing it now, where it's... Um, you know, us in the, the windows and then screen sharing images. Yeah, I would I would just add that. Um, keep it simple. Um, just, you know, try not to add too many elements within the Hangout. It can get a little um, a little complicated. And and really, you just, like Stephanie said, you want people to have, have a great experience and great interaction between your experts and, and your audience. So adding in too many bells and whistles just, just makes things, uh, you know, a little, a little too complicated. Um, we usually just keep it straight. Other than screen share um, images or PowerPoint slides, we usually keep it um, pretty simple. We um, have a space in our gallery space that um, where we can actually close the doors and create like a little studio in the same way where Josh is hanging out from with a glass wall behind that looks into his, his penguin exhibit. We've got a space that has double glass walls that can look into our gallery spaces. So normally I'll hang out from there or we'll set up our hangouts there if the room's available. And you can actually see visitors walking back and forth uh, in the museum. Um, you can hold hangouts uh, from your mobile device. Um, but again, um, I'd be a little um, hesitant to do that. Um, you know, a wired connection is, is always best when holding hangouts, especially if you're going to have multiple people hanging out with you and you're going to do things like screen share and, and you know, be a drain on any bandwidth. Um, in one of the hangouts that we did in the past, we actually had a classroom hang out with us. Um, and it was one of our friends who used to volunteer at the museum and he went on to be, a, be an elementary school teacher and he brought in his class and we had a, a lot of feedback issues. Um, there, was a, there was a big echo that was created um, from the class. The, the kids were really excited. They were yelling and screaming, which was great, but <laughs> it also created uh, a little bit of an echo. So I see there's a question from Anne again. Thanks for the questions, Anne. Um, about hanging out with multiple classrooms and, and technical issues that could arise. So I wonder if, if Dan and Josh, you could talk maybe about a little bit about um, how that works behind the scenes and how you make sure that there's no, you know, sort of echo and, and things like that going on. Well, I went dark. So Dan, do you wanna do you wanna? <laughs> <skip it>? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice trick. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the way that we've done it is we found uh, that three to four classes tend to be kind of the sweet spot. Uh, really, that that allows you uh, if one class uh, you know, school's canceled. We had a, you know one class there was a hailstorm in Texas, uh, so they didn't have school that day. Um, it still leaves you with uh, you know two to three classes. Uh, which is really uh, what you want for your interactivity. Uh, and what we found worked is we connect with the teachers in the classroom, uh, preferably before the day of the Hangout, but also the day of the Hangout. Uh, and we ask them to keep the camera on the classroom, uh, but when the classroom is not asking questions, to hit the mute button. Uh, and Google does give you the tools uh, to do that uh, yourself from sort of this control room toolbox for the Hangout. Uh, but we really found that the teacher has a better pulse on their classroom and knows, you know, when a student's going to ask a good question or if the class is laughing and they want to share that. Uh, and if they're if they're quick on the the muting of the microphone, we found that that works really well and takes care of the the feedback issue, but still gives you sort of that audience interaction, which really enriches, uh, you know, the archived video as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just echo exactly um, what he just said and. 
we always try to connect with the classrooms anyways, um, just because of, you know, the fact that um, minors are going to be on camera. So we always just let them know. Um, as of right now, Google doesn't have an official um, release form, so we kind of just made our own and kind of just suggested that we want everyone to participate, and if kids, you know, have parents or, you know, restrictions against being on video, that um, they just sit somewhere where the camera isn't facing them. And, um, again, I'll just echo that there are the tools available um, in the Hangout as um, the person who's putting this on as sort of a control panel where you can control the volume, um, if what everyone else is doing, but we do um, connect with all the teachers and kind of lay out, you know, our expectations for them as participants. So, I mean, they're usually very good about the microphone and muting when they're not on camera and then unmuting when they are. I'm glad, though, Ryan, that you did bring up this whole issue with the echoing of the sound because I actually had a, um, a hangout catastrophe when um, I'm actually part of this um, kind of unofficial group of interpretive planners from around the United States and we do these virtual meetups every once in a while to kind of talk about issues and you know so that's actually another way that we're using it is for professional development this tool for professional development nice. um, and so I hosted one and I was really excited I got everyone up to speed in terms of you know this is how you set up your Google Plus account and we did you know weeks and weeks of all this rigor morale and then everyone logs on and the echo effect of having 10 windows with people not mic'd but rather using the built-in mics in their laptops it was so disruptive that eventually that I had to set up a free conference call line and, oh, no. and do it the old-fashioned way and it was so disappointing so I don't know you know it to me that's an ongoing issue um, so I don't know if if Google has done um, any work towards um, you know, changing that situation so it's more usable for groups of people rather than individuals mic'd with um, headsets. Right. So uh, I guess I should mention um, uh, there is. We did mention this in the first hangout. There is a, there is a, a selection of apps along the left hand side of the hangout window that allow you to control different aspects of the hangout. And one of them, Daniel mentioned, it's called Control Room. And it allows you to mute mics of, of various presenters, uh, kill their camera, eject them from the Hangout if you want to. Um, it also allows you to play with their volume a little bit. So if um, you know someone doesn't have their volume turned up or enough, or um, you know there's some sort of issue, you can always manipulate um, that that way. Um, you know there is something to be said about uh, practicing with people ahead of time, um, you know, making sure you're in touch with all of your on-air um, people ahead of time, going over any issues, answering any questions, um, that sort of thing. It's not just something that you say, okay, everyone, we're going to meet at such and such a date and time, and you know, away we go. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing your prep work um, in advance. For me, I like to have our hangouts planned about a month in advance. We usually do one a month. And I like to be able to promote the next Hangout at the end of the current one. Um, so I usually like to have the on-air people um, lined up and ready to go and, and have you know time blocked off in their, in their calendars and, and things like that. Um, so there is a lot of uh, you know, behind-the-scenes prep work that you can do. Um, and another, another aspect of, of producing a Hangout is you're, you can pick and choose who gets to be in the main screen at any given time. And I've been trying to keep up with that at this Hangout. Um, you can also turn that off and, and let it go. And there's voice recognition software in Hangout. So if any noise, any, any sort of if anyone coughs or anything like that, the Hangout will switch um, the main view to, to the different presenters and wherever the noise is coming from. So um, you know, it, it all depends on how comfortable you are with the tool. Um, you know, but I would suggest um, like we've said before, you know, make sure there's one producer that is watching those sort of issues. It'll definitely add um, a little bit more professionalism to your Hangouts um, than just sort of letting it all go. Right. I mean, one of the things that I, I haven't seen anybody do, but I'm guessing that people, people have done, is basically doing kind of a multi-camera shoot where you have, you know, one person over here sitting down and another person in, standing in the galleries to, you know, and they're in the same institution, they're on the same hangout, and the 
the control uh, center allows you to basically, if you want to, just switch between. You could really do kind of a multi-camera shoot uh, with three people or three different cameras and setups in, in one institution if you wanted to. But you know what most people are using it for right now is 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 bridging these larger gaps between institutions like we're we're witnessing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, what you just said, Scott, is exactly what the Minnesota Zoo actually does when we are um, doing our hangouts, especially when we're out on exhibit um, somewhere. We have anywhere between three and four cameras put up around the zoo, um, and then one of them obviously being on myself as the producer or the moderator, and then we just kind of tool back and forth um, between the cameras, and then we'll have an additional five screens that we're monitoring for the um, classrooms that are on, because I believe you can have up to 11 different cameras um, on a Google Hangout at any one time. So you can switch back and forth between all those all of those different screens. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that came in last time that we didn't get around to, and I'm not sure if anyone knows the answers to this, is are there any accessibility uh, functionality built into Google Hangouts for closed captioning or well, I think um, what I, I think what I mentioned last time is that, um, and I believe this is true, is when uh, because things are auto archived to YouTube, YouTube actually has built-in accessibility um, tools. For example, the kind of you know real-time captioning um, tool that is available. Um, it's not entirely accurate, but it, it you know it's it's a great way to provide. Some captioning services. Um, that's just one thing that we um, have used in the past. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, other people have experimented with having a one of the windows actually be a live um, sign language interpreter. Um, but you know, again, they're they're so small. The their little thumbnail is so small that perhaps that's not really legible for um, most viewers. Um, so. That's a really interesting idea. Yeah, I would just, um, uh, I would just, I think it was um, Jason from NASA who mentioned that last time, where they had someone who had their own camera, and they were they were uh, signing the the hangout as it went along um, in the lower window. But he did mention it was a little small for people to actually people that needed to read the sign language. Um, uh, to 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 read that, um, but like Stephanie said, there is closed captioning that you can apply that you can edit after um, the video is is uploaded to YouTube. Um, I haven't done that yet, um, but uh, we'll be looking to do that um, hopefully in the future. Um, the other thing um, you could also do if you if you're dealing with um, you know uh, if you need to do multiple languages. Um, you know, you could also just you could just have people um, uh, hanging out with you who speak multiple languages. We did one a few months ago, and our cur curator was from France, so he did a little bit in French uh, throughout the hangout. Um, you know, it's it's really up to you. It depends on the audiences you're trying to target, um, and and really the content of the hangout. Um, uh, you know, it really depends on 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 all those things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that is an issue we touched on a little bit last time, but it's just something that everybody should be aware of, is the time delay between uh, what we're saying right now, what I'm saying, and when you actually hear it. There's actually an intentional, uh, it's probably 10 to 15 second, maybe even 20 second uh, delay. And so there are some things that if you're trying to do something that's that's live in real time, uh, that's that is going to be affected by that delay. There are some things you need to be aware of. It's not even though it, it, it everything says this is live. It's uh, actually you're you're watching it 20 seconds after it already happened. Um, I just um, I just wanted to uh, Anne asked another great question about if anyone was charging for Hangouts, and um, I haven't. Uh, done a lot of research into this yet. It's just something that came across my radar. But there's there's something called Google Helpouts, and uh, I don't know if the other presenters have heard about this yet. But um, basically, it's it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, hangout 
um, with a, an expert in, in a certain area that you pay for. Um, it's all done through Google Wallet, um, the payments, so you have to have set up an account and things like that. Um, I'm just going to uh, screen share my, um, my PowerPoint slide and just show you guys. Um, but you can, again, you can just Google it. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, just type in Google Help Out. I'll skip ahead here. Um, and really, um, I, I'd be interested to, to take a look at this from an institutional perspective. I don't know if there would be some issues with, you know, charging for curatorial expertise through a Hangout. Um, but really what it is, it's, it's real help. Like it says, it's real help from real people in real time. So you, you sign your institution up as someone who's an expert in uh, whatever field, and then people basically, they go on and they find you, um, and they schedule a Hangout with you. Um, and they, you know, there's a whole process that, that is involved in, you know, what content you want to share and vice versa. And then you, there, there's a fee that's charged. So, um, you know, I don't know. There could be some ethical issues and things like that. A lot of institutions are free and, and all that sort of thing. But there is, there is that option if you want to go down that road. Mm -hmm. Ryan, one of the things we touched on a little bit last time, but I know you, we ran out of time, was was what you guys do with your uh, analytics. And I think it would be interesting to hear if uh, any of the other presenters have, uh, can say a little bit about where the different points of, what you can do with all these different access points from the live broadcast to the YouTube uh, availability to the events page. What can, how can you really do some, audience assessment uh, and different ways of, of looking at both your live and your post uh, hangout audiences. Um, yeah, is if, if anyone wanted to, to jump in here, they can. Um, uh, the anal analytics for, for hangouts just recently changed on YouTube. Um, they're a little more integrated, which is great. Um, but one of the benefits um, that we mentioned before is the ability to also embed the hangout on your website. So you can also look at um, time on page and length of page view, things like that, through Google Analytics if you have that uh, connected to your website. So we at the ROM, we always produce a, a, an event page on our website that mirrors the Google Plus event page, and we embed to hang out there. And that's the page, or that's the link that we actually push when we want people to, to view the Hangout. A lot of people don't have a Google Plus account, but that is growing. Um, so we always make sure people know that they can watch the Hangout there on our website, and we can watch the time on page grow over time. Um, but then the main place to get analytics is, is through your YouTube account. And um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just screen share um, the slide deck here just to show you um, where to access that um, really quickly. Um, oops, that's the wrong screen. Just a second. There it is. And I'll just go back to, um, so this is a screenshot of our, of our um, YouTube channel. And if you click on um, your logo at the top here, you'll see um, a drop-down list. And you want to click on Video Manager. And then that'll bring up a whole selection of, of, uh, of, of tabs over here on, on the right-hand side. And one of them will be Analytics, um, as you can see here. And then there's a whole bunch of other tabs that you can choose on. But really, all you need to do is you um, enter in this box the name of the playlist. Um, and then you can manipulate the, um, the amount of data that you want to look at. So you can do the last 30 days or the entire lifetime of the playlist. Um, and before, this was a, a little convoluted process. You had to create a group. And um, you, know, you had to add each video one by one. But now it seems to be a little more integrated with the whole experience. Um, anything anyone else wants to add on that? I mean, I think for us, we, um, you know, we, we just use the analytic, the statistics that are available through YouTube, um, and those are incredibly illuminating for us um, because, you know, it's, at this point, the analytics that they provide are so, um, I mean, they're so detailed. Uh, you know, you can tell how many views, um, how many minutes people have watched. Um, you can tell the demographics, so we can tell, for example, all of the 127 um, countries and the and the ranking in terms of you know how many viewer the the most number of viewers. You can tell the gender. That's something that's inferred from the um, 
you know, the, the YouTube account information. Um, and so for us, that's been really helpful. Um, but again, you know, we're not really, we're just kind of see, looking at this tool as um, kind of a blank slate. And so we don't intend to use these statistics to create a formula that we think works, but, but rather, um, you know, we're continuing to experiment with new ways of, of doing Hangouts and engaging people through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo exactly what Stephanie just said. Um, we don't use the analytics um, necessarily to, like she said, create a formula, but we do look to see specifically the different countries that are watching um, because, you know, Google Plus is such a global platform, um, and obviously, you know, as the zoo, we want to educate people about wildlife and nature everywhere. So, you know, we are always looking at different opportunities where we can connect with classrooms or different people from other countries and if that means you know that we schedule a hangout on purpose um, when it's 11 o'clock at night here um, to reach some people in other parts of the world then um, then we're always looking to, to find new ways to do that too just to connect with other people. Great. I've got a quick question for, for you Josh and Dan. Are there any extra um, you know numbers that you can get by doing a connected classroom or is it just relatively the same stuff that you get through YouTube? I actually uh, don't know. From uh, my experience, they seem to be uh, exactly identical. Um, my understanding is connected classrooms is really just this, you know, sort of external frame um, that you're doing these, you know, special uh, hangouts on air in. But they're at their core, they're just a hangout uh, on air that's connecting with a specific audience. Okay. Yep. Do we have any more questions coming in from Twitter? I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, did you want to, were there any more on the event page? Sean? No, there, there's not. But I, I, I don't know if the panelists, we did talk about having the panelists have an opportunity to, to ask each other questions. So if you guys have any. Sure. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing um, sort of what other folks' uh, process is from sort of, uh, you know, idea to uh, end of show. Um, I guess I can share a little bit of, of what we do first. Uh, we, you know, typically have a, a, a group of folks uh, that come together and sort of brainstorm, um, you know, uh, what the next Hangout is going to be. Uh, and then sort of a, a subset goes off and sort of, you know, runs up a run a show, uh, shares that with the group and gets feedback uh, and sort of refine that process. Uh, and then we actually have um, uh, sort of a practice run of show uh, a day or a couple days before, uh, and then we do the show. Um, and just wondering if folks' uh, experiences are similar to that or uh, if you do do something different. Uh, no, my, my process is pretty similar to that. We don't, um, we have a pretty small staff here at the Minnesota Zoo, so, you know, the people that are involved are very limited. I, I pretty much decide, you know, what the next topic is going to be, and, you know, I'm pretty, um, you know, open with our Google Plus communities and our Twitter communities. We, I find that those are the two that really engage a lot with Google Plus Hangouts, but I, I even just go out and ask. I'm like, hey, you know, we've, we haven't done a Hangout in a while, like, what are you guys wanting to hear? Um, and that also helps me just get ideas for other future Hangouts. Um, but then pretty much, you know, I work with whatever topic we pick, the topic expert, to make sure that it works with their schedule. And, and then I will write up, you know, an itinerary or a run of show. And then I'll also post that to our Google Plus event page, you know, through Google Docs. So then that way everyone who's watching or wanting to watch, they can actually click and see um, beforehand. I try to put it up about a week beforehand. Um, and they can kind of get a sense about, one, the timing, if they're going to be able to have enough time to watch it, um, and then also a little bit more detail about what we're talking about. That's great. Um, yeah, same, similar for us, but I try, to, um, I try to have mine planned out, like I said earlier, about a month in advance, um, and I, I usually look at what's going on overall in the institution, if there's a new exhibit coming up or there's some programs or something like that. Um, our next Hangout, um, some shameless self-promotion here, is going to be on June 11th um, at 1 o'clock Eastern. 
and we've got a new uh, textile show opening up on the 21st of June. So we're going to hang out with the curator of that show, who's an external curator and, and our in-house um, uh, fashion expert. Um, and the next one in July, we're hoping to connect with some of our, some of our curators in the field um, in, in Alberta. Um, so we, I, I kind of, you know, get get a pulse of what's happening in the institution. Um, you know, we we do if there's a major exhibition coming in, we'll try to do one during um, during the run of the exhibition or beforehand. Talk about that, um, and then uh, you know, sometimes people will come to me and say, "I want to do a hangout. I've got this this cool thing to talk about," or if we've got um, uh, colleagues at other institutions or universities that. that are collaborating on a project. Um, we recently did one with uh, a postdoctoral fellow here at the institution and and with the Getty, talking about um, looking at fakes in, in in our collection and, and determining if a, if an object is genuine or or, or a reproduction. We've also done them with universities. We've done uh, had a few of our mummies CT scanned at a couple of the local universities and and had uh, um, some collaboration with them on on determining you know. Uh, how the mummy um, uh, met its end. <laughs> so it was it was an interesting topic. So we we try to um, not make it uh, about us all the time. We try to hang out with just like we're doing now. Spread spread the love around to other institutions and and really talk about things that um, that touch on all of our institutions. Um, but yeah, I always do an event page on our website. I always embed the hangout there. Um, I always do a lot of promotion on our other social networks, on on Facebook and Twitter. A lot of pre-promotion. I treat it really like a like a regular program. Um, um, you know, people aren't going to find out about it if you don't talk about it. So you got to make sure that you're using all of the tools that you have at your disposal to promote the hangout and 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 really ramp it up. And I would echo everything that everyone just said, um, but especially. Mm -hmm. Um, what Ryan just said about, um, you know, planning it ahead of time like you would any other program and heavily promoting it um, because, you know, why are we doing these, having these interactions if no one's watching? So um, as far as process, I think I mentioned earlier that um, primarily, or at this time it's only education who is using the, the Hangout platform as an engagement tool. And so it's a very small group who's actually involved. It's usually me, and or it's always me, and then um, Lisa Mazzola, who's um, the director of our school and teacher programs, and then Jessica Baldenhofer, who's on our school and teacher programs group. And um, we'll just come up with an idea, you know, maybe like three, four months ahead of time, um, and then maybe about a couple months out, I'll actually set set up the um, Google event page and, as Ryan said, um, embed the Hangout in there and then heavily promote via Twitter and other social media streams. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, we're, a lot of the, the you know, what I've, what I've heard from this conversation is about convening a panel of experts. And for us, our model is more about bringing the engagement tools that we use in you know, at the museum outwards. Uh, so less about having experts talk and share knowledge um, as opposed to inciting a conversation. Um, and so it's usually a, just a facilitated conversation, um, which, you know, is very artfully done by the, you know, either Lisa or Jessica or myself. Um, but really it's more about getting others to share their interpretations of whatever the topic is. Um, and using it as a platform for conversation rather than having, let's say, um, you know, a curator talking about an exhibition. However, that being said, um, we would, you know, very much welcome mixing it up and having more of that kind of, um, you know, lecture style uh, uh, hangout in the future. Great. Do any of you? I, this is another question from the past, but do any of you edit your videos post uh, broadcast? And is is that even technically possible? Um, in YouTube, I've lobbed off. Um, maybe if there's some dead time at the end or at the beginning, I've lobbed it off, and that's actually possible using the um, built-in um, video manager tools in YouTube. 
Yeah, we. Um, I've done. I've done the same. Um, I've never actually downloaded the MP4 file and, and done any serious editing. Although you know that is possible if you wanted to. Um, I have. Um, I did have a catastrophe um, happen where there, we had some sound issues at the start of one hangout. So the hangout got started. People were talking, but there was no sound. Um, for for a few minutes actually, so um, I went in after the fact, and and we had one of our deputy directors on on the hangout as well. So it was a little a little bit embarrassing, but um, uh, you know it was fine. I just went in and logged off the first few minutes where there was no sound, and, and just put a comment in the comment section that said something like we had some technical difficulties. Um, you know we're starting this hangout a few minutes in, and apologize for any uh, you know any issues. Um, we, we actually, um, because we have about, uh, I think there's 23 or 24 of them now, we've actually used them at other events as sort of background um, content. So we'll put it up on a screen at an event, and, and we usually have uh, earphones plugged into to a, a system where people can sit down on a couch and watch the Hangouts. Because they're all on a playlist now, they actually play um, continuously until you stop them. So it's uh, you know another way to to use the content. Um, we have an event called Friday Night Live, um, and we have uh, some smaller, um, uh, quieter uh, uh, rooms where people can actually sit down and, and watch the Hangouts um, if they like. Um, so we've done that as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any of you have other questions for each other? I don't think there's any reason why we can't wrap up a couple minutes early. Yeah, um, I was just I was just gonna say, Scott. I think uh, you know I think we've covered most of the questions that were from last time, and and we've done quite a bit of uh, of of you know uh, question answering without the Q and A app functioning this time around. So um, thanks everyone for for doing that and and appreciate it. And and I'll hand it over to you, Scott, for the last word. Well, I. Appreciate all of you coming, and I particularly want to thank our guests, Daniel and Josh and Ryan and Stephanie. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, this is a, all of, of a volunteer project, so uh, really great for everybody to be willing to sh professionally share with everybody in the field. And uh, this is this is a program that's put together by the Museum Computer Network, MCN. Uh, if you haven't become involved with MCN in the past, I'd encourage you to. It's got all sorts of new life to it in the last five years. It's it's really become a, a really interesting organization. The uh, fall conference is coming up this November 19th through 22nd in Dallas, which if you've been following at all what's going on uh, at the Dallas Museums, there's lots of really interesting things that uh, even if you just need to conference as an excuse to go to Dallas and see all the cool stuff they're doing down there. It's, it's a good excuse. So uh, I think you get a lot out of the conference. It's always got some innovative and uh, serious and fun things going on. So I hope you'll join us in Dallas in November. And keep your eyes out. We might do another MCN Pro this year while we're rethinking the whole program. Thanks again to everybody. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.